Okay, anybody know what this is? It's a mountain, obviously. It's a volcano. This was Mount St. Helens. So this is up in the Pacific Northwest. This picture was taken probably in the mid-1970s. So Mount St. Helens uh, was one of these gorgeous uh, cascade peaks, just a little under 10,000 feet in elevation. Uh, the area around it, spectacular. Lakes for fishing and boating and um, great hunting, amazing backcountry skiing. And it was located about two hour drive from Portland and maybe two and a half from Seattle. So you have two of these huge metropolitan areas, you know, probably three, four million people that are really close to this area. So it was popular, especially in the summer, people all over the place. Um, and then back in the mid-1970s, about the time this photo was taken, a couple of geologists from the United States Geological Survey, uh, Rocky Crandall and Don Molino, wrote a big comprehensive report on all the Cascade Peaks. They looked at the geologic histories of all the peaks going from um, Mount Baker, northern uh, Washington, Mount Tiribaldi in southern um, Canada, all the way down to Mount Lassen in California. And they said there were two volcanoes that over the last one to 2,000 years were really unusually active. One was Mount St. Helens, and the other was Medicine Lake Volcano, which is right on the Oregon-California um, border. So they said, and actually about Mount St. Helens, they said based on past eruptions, this thing will probably erupt before the end of the century. And turns out they were really right about this. Mount St. Helens probably last erupted um, in the 1800s or 1700s. There's a lot of Native American lore up there where they described well an eruption that happened on the north flank of St. Helens. And then when geologists went in the 70s and collected rock samples and started age dating them, they found an area called the Goat Rocks Dome, a series of lava domes that obviously formed right about the time when all the Native Americans were telling them that there were eruptions. Now, obviously there's no written record and no photographic record, but you know, handed down um, knowledge in that culture pretty much had it dead on. So in March of 1980, okay, if you've been, how many of you have been to the Pacific Northwest? Anybody been to St. Helens? If you've been up that way, these peaks are enormous. And I mean, we have 14,000 foot peaks here in Colorado. Some of these mountains are 14,000 feet. But what's really impressive there is that the surrounding land is only sea level to 1,000 feet. So the, the relief on these things, 10,000 feet or more. We just don't get that in Colorado. I mean, everything kind of starts at 5,000 and goes up from there. Long's Peak is about the closest that you get in terms of that much relief. And because of the proximity to the ocean, you get huge amounts of snow. So these peaks stay snow-capped all year long, lots of glaciers. March is pretty much still the dead of winter there. So this was the end of March, March 31st. Uh, there was a blast from the top of Mount St. Helens that somebody in a plane managed to catch. And it wasn't a very big blast. It was a little steam blast you can see here. But this was the first eruption that had happened in the lower 48 since Mount Alaskan in California erupted back uh, during World War I. So pretty long time. And when you think about it, okay, what's near to Mount St. Helens? Two big population centers, right? Have these people ever seen a volcanic eruption up there? Nope. Everybody wants to see it, so this thing was immediately popular. People wanted to get up and get close and see the volcano erupt. So this is a photo right after that first little blast. And it was basically a steam blast that pulverized some rocks. It left a little crater up in top. I mean, that crater looks small. It's actually 300 meters across. You can stick three football fields across that thing. Uh, these mountains are big. And you can see how much snow is covered, you know? It's a real thick snowpack up there. So over the next month, Mount St. Helens started erupting a lot, these little steam blasts constantly. No fresh magma, this was just pulverized rock that was already making up the volcanic structure. But obviously something was coming up from down below, heating the water, 
and then creating these blasts that would pulverize the rock. So it was pretty obvious that there was magma rising from below. Even those eruptions here were not magmatic. They weren't fresh magma. It was just pulverized old dome and volcanic rock. But they were pretty picturesque. Sometimes you'd have 20 or 30 of these a day. And this was a nice streak of good weather that they had up there, especially for the spring. I've worked up there in the spring, and you can go up there and not see the sun for a month. It's not unusual just to have it just sort of piss and dribble all over you the whole time. So this was really good volcano viewing weather. And it's also a bit like, you know, if you've been to Yellowstone, how people are with the bears and the animals, you know, who can get the closest, who can be the dumbest. Well, that was going on here as well. And people were climbing all over this thing, trying to get as close as they could to the vent. And it was just, it was a real show, you know? Um, so from a monitoring perspective, one of the first things that volcanologists do when a volcano acts up, it might sound funny, is here they took a helicopter onto many different parts of the volcano and they pounded bicycle reflectors onto any sort of big stable rock structure. And then what you do is you set up a surveying system somewhere pretty far away from the volcano. And this one here is probably six, seven miles from the volcano itself. And then what you do is you shoot a, a laser to these reflectors every day. And you probably have 20 or 30 of these reflectors set up all over. Now, what the laser does is it takes a little while to get to the reflector and it takes a little while to get back. And we have really precise surveying methods that use this stuff. Now, a big mountain shouldn't be changing its shape, right? But volcanoes do. You know, as magma gets injected in that volcano, they will start to expand. And that bicycle reflector will start to move a little closer to you. So you can see the volcano deform with pretty simple surveying techniques. And what they noticed, I'll see if this works, you guys sort of see this bulging area right there? Well, that area was moving at a rate of up to five feet a day to the north, which is this direction. And that's a pretty fast rate for a 10,000 foot mountain to be strolling across the Pacific Northwest. So they knew that there was magma that was starting to come up, get injected into the cone itself and it was deforming the north side of the volcano. So the people that were in charge of monitoring this volcano got really concerned. Uh, there was um, cabins to the north, there was a big lake called Spirit Lake that was especially popular for you know, people to come up and boat and fish and vacation, and that was right at the base of St. Helens. Lots of logging operations in the area going on in that. So what they did is they decided to cordon off an area 18 miles around the north part of the volcano. That's pretty far. I mean, when you think about it, that's from basically here to the interstate. And they said, nobody other than USGS personnel can go inside this. It's restricted. It's a lot like what's going up Pudu Canyon right now with the fires, you know, where they can only get up on there with emergency orders and stuff. And again, you know how people are with listening to government officials. They don't. So at any point in time, people are going around roadblocks and sneaking in, getting to their cabins. A lot of people were just camping and trying to get close so they could, you know, get better pictures and stuff. So it became a, I mean, it's such a huge area. And lots of dirt roads, lots of trails. They just couldn't keep people out of there. So at any point in time, there are probably hundreds of people inside the restricted zone that shouldn't have been in there. So this is what the survey sites look like. High paid field assistant there, but this is, uh, this is the little laser range finder there. It just shoots a laser out and basically just clocks the time of flight to go to the reflector and back to a very high degree of accuracy. And you can see centimeter changes pretty easily with these sorts of systems. So that was one of the jobs that volcanologists had, were just sit out there and just measure to the volcano every day, see which areas were moving the most, which areas were stable, trying to get an idea of how the volcano would deform and where the eruption might take place. If it's to the north, it's kind of a concern. There's lots of uh, cabins and families out there. Um, Seattle was kind of north west of there, but there were still some population centers they were worried about. 
if it deformed to the south, it would have been even worse because there were several towns right at the base of the volcano on the south. So they wanted to see which areas were the most no, um, mobile. The north area was. So that's where they put the um, restricted zone. Got a lot of free time when you're uh, doing those surveys? <sighs> you know, you, you do because you can't survey every second. But you, what you also have besides survey equipment is you might have a gas um, monitoring station there as well. They use an instrument called a COSPEC, which is fancy for correlation spectrometer. And what it does is it, it uh, measures UV light coming from the sky. And that's all it does, it just, how much UV light is coming. And one thing we've learned is that SO2 gas, which is one of the more common magmatic gases that you get off volcanoes, absorbs SO2 in a big way. So, you know, if you see a huge drop in your UV light, that means lots of SO2 gas is coming out. And they can scale it and, give you a pretty precise amount. Sometimes they would have 500 tons of SO2 a day. Sometimes it was a lot more. So you might be measuring gases there. You might have a seismometer that, you know, obviously needs fixing. So you have all these different instruments running at the same time. Is there something involving CO2 volcanoes? CO2 is definitely a gas that is liberated from a volcano. Um, Mount St. Helens kicked out a lot. It's hard to measure the volcanic amount because so much comes off the land surface. You know, especially at night when plants respire. You know, they take in CO2 during the day during photosynthesis, but at night it acts more like us where plants breathe and it kicks out some CO2. So you can't really tell all the time what the magmatic component is versus the biological component versus other things. Um, the cool thing about CO2, though, is that it's a pretty dense gas. And at a volcano in somewhere in Africa, I think it's the Cameroon, I, I mentioned this, I think, class period or two ago, they had a lake up at the summit. It's just a water lake. But CO2 had accumulated at the base of the lake. And then one night, it basically bubbled up in one giant bubble, spilled over the edges of the volcano. And because it was so dense, it descended down the sides into some of the valleys where there were people living. And when um, relief workers came in, all they found were dead bodies. Nobody was burned. They couldn't tell why these people had died. It took them months to figure out what had happened. And it was basically a big descending gas cloud of CO2, which you can't smell. You know, if you're down there, you wouldn't smell this at all. But it displaced all the oxygen and they all suffocated. You know, they were breathing the whole time, but all they were doing was breathing in CO2 and exhaling CO2. And after 30, 40 seconds, they all passed out and, and died. It killed several hundred people. So it's, it's a gas, it's concerning. It came out here. So on, so that whole sort of, you know, preliminary activity lasted a little over a month, from the end of March through the end of April. And then on May 18th, so this was early in the morning, Sunday morning, 8.31 a.m., uh, two geologists had uh, rented a plane, and they were just flying over to take pictures. At that very time, there was an earthquake, and it didn't even have anything to do with St. Helens. It was about 20 miles north of St. Helens, a good size earthquake, but it shook the whole area. And all of that broken rock on the north side, that bulge I showed earlier, you know, become very weak from getting pushed out and getting broken. That whole area just slipped downhill and released all the magma that was inside. So this magma was under pressure until that landslide happened. And then all of that material was able to expand rapidly just as these folks were flying over the top of it. Um, just another story about this. So I had a friend who was a graduate student at Santa Barbara. He was just starting his PhD. He was just a year or two older than most of you, just got into grad school. And he wanted to do a project on volcanoes and was going to go up to Mount Rainier and work on some of the old mud flow deposits there. So he drove himself up from Santa Barbara just as St. Helens went through some of those beginning eruptions at the end of March. And he just sort of drove into the volcano observatory there and said, hey, I'm a geology grad student. I'll help. You know, I'm looking for a, a research project anyway. And they said, yeah, great. So they stuck him out at this, uh, they had this old trailer that they had on a ridge 
6.8 miles from the summit of St. Helens, and they said, you sit out here and take notes. Every time it erupts, every time you feel an earthquake, you just take as much data as you can. So he sat out there for a month and a half, mostly by himself. They would bring him food every few days, but he was just kind of a hermit living in this crappy old trailer. And this is the weirdest thing. So May 17th, the day before this, his advisor said, you know, you can't just fart around up in the Pacific Northwest forever. You got to get back to school. You got classes, you know, you got teaching responsibilities. It's time to come back. We got a ticket for you. Be at the Portland airport tomorrow morning. So late the day before this happened, he was replaced by a senior member of the observatory, David Johnson. And so David Johnson was out on the ridge when this happened. My friend Harry was in the airport at Portland. Turns out David Johnson was killed by this blast. Oh it should have been Harry. He was just there a day before and had been there since the beginning. So his advisor saved his ass. Just remember that, you know? We, we provide a useful service every once in a while. Um, sad thing is Harry died um, 11 years later um, at a pyroclastic flow eruption in Japan, leading a really famous French volcanology couple, the Crafts. They had done tons of videos and stuff. If you've seen older volcanic videos, this French couple were probably the two that put this together. And Harry was guiding them at this really nasty eruption at Mount Unzen. And they got caught in an eruption in the middle of the night and they died along with 41 other, uh, mostly uh, TV and uh, print reporters. So Harry lived a dangerous life, but he was spared at this one. So this happened just as these geologists flew over St. Helens, and it was an amazing blast. So this blast at times moved 600 miles an hour. It went 18 miles, basically from here to the interstate in two minutes. Just ridiculous. And you can see, see this area right here? See those little sort of trails of smoke? Those are actually rocks, probably the size of houses that are being ejected at near supersonic speeds. Just amazing. Yeah, there were blocks that were thrown 18 miles that were the size of this room. The blast was estimated to be about 500 times the size of a Hiroshima-sized uh, atomic weapon. So it dwarfs anything humans can produce. So this photo was taken by somebody who had slipped inside the restricted zone had been up, saw the eruption coming, hopped in their car. Apparently they were driving down this dirt road about 100 miles an hour, sticking the camera out the window and just taking as many pictures as they could. So sometimes it was the sky, sometimes it was the ground, but they got some pretty amazing photos. And they ended up living, but it ended up killing nearly 70 people who just shouldn't have been in there. So after that initial blast, that took two minutes. And then the weird thing about that blast is it left a deposit of ash about four or five inches thick. That's all. So that huge blast only left light ash that was about this thick. Do you think that's going to survive geologic time? That stuff gets blown away in about a week. So here you have this huge eruption, and there's going to be nothing in the rock record from it. And this was kind of the first time the volcanologists had seen anything like that, and it really sort of... Uh, as a geologist, it sets you back a little bit because you think, you know, you go out and you look at the rocks, you look at the ash layers, and you think you can put together the history. But there are some events that just don't leave much behind, even though they were really, really powerful. Um, so that blast event might not even get captured in the geologic record. But what happened afterwards definitely will get captured. So for the next maybe 12 hours or so, after that initial blast decapitated the top of the volcano, all of the <clears throat> sort of force and fury was directed upward. So for the next 12 hours, ash was ejected up into the stratosphere, sometimes 100,000 feet or more, drifted across the US. They had ash fall heavy in like Yakima, Washington. It was dark as night in the middle of the day. Uh, they got a couple feet of ash that fell out. Um, some ash fell in Colorado. They had ash, measurable ash falling as far away as New York. And then traces got up into the atmosphere 
blocked out the sun for the next six to eight months and affected worldwide temperatures. But, you know, for 12 hours, the stuff just jetted, jetted, jetted at near supersonic rates. Yeah. You said it adjusted global temperatures? Did yeah. It reduced, or? it reduced, yeah. Yep. Now, that's always been, you know, just what role do volcanoes play in climate? And there's a lot of work that has gone into that because we want to know, you know, how much do volcanoes contribute to climate change versus other things, including humans? So it's been a big goal of science to measure kind of what's coming off these things worldwide. And the prevailing idea is that even though you get spikes with certain eruptions, kind of over a long time span, hundreds of years or so, the amount coming off of volcanoes really hasn't changed over time. There's definitely nothing going on since the Industrial Revolution in terms of volcanic production that says, oh, we should have way more CO2 in the atmosphere. There just hasn't been an uptick since then. So that's why the vast majority of scientists say, you know, the CO2 levels that are definitely increasing, I mean, we've been measuring these for 50, 60 years now, and they've doubled. I mean, when we first started measuring CO2, it was down around 250 parts per million. Now it's up around 450 parts per million. And, you know, if the volcanoes aren't doing more, then you start looking for other culprits, and it just keeps coming back to humans. So, does it yeah. produce CO2 in the atmosphere, or does it eject CO2 into the atmosphere? It ejects CO2 in the atmosphere, which should warm stuff up, but at the same time, it puts all this ash in the atmosphere, the which blocks out the sun. It also produces a lot of sulfur gases, and sulfur gases, as we talked about earlier, filter out lots of ultraviolet light. So overall, even though you do get some CO2 that may raise temperatures between the ash and the sulfur gases, it actually sort of not only cancels out the CO2, but drops temperatures as well. So most volcanic eruptions that are big will drop temperatures for some time. Mount St. Helens, it was a few months. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, 10 years later, um, that lowered temperatures worldwide for about two years. Part of it is where the volcano is located, too. The ones on the equator have the most effect because that's where the most sunlight comes into the Earth. So if they get up there and they block it out, it's really effective. You can think of an eruption in a polar area. Think of the, if you had an eruption in a polar area in that pole's winter. It's not going to block out anything because the sun isn't shining that time of year. So equatorial eruptions really affect climate far more than ones like St. Helens that are in more temperate parts. So of like the biggest explosions we know, like, I remember, I remember you showing us that chart, I don't remember two of them, like Yellowstone being two of them. Yeah. But those were, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years ago. Right. Have we been able to figure out what those volcanoes did to the climate? I'm really stretching out. No, well, you know, the Yellowstone ones, 600,000 years, 1.3 million, 2 million years ago. What happened the next few years after those? No, nah, we don't have a good idea of what happened. Um, there was, and I mentioned this a few class periods ago, there was an eruption 70,000 years ago at Toba, which is on, it's right on the equator. And that eruption was as big as the Yellowstone eruptions. And I mentioned that that's a time where if you look at human DNA, we almost checked out. So it clearly affected the planet in a way that almost made us go extinct. So was that cooling? Most likely. You know, when you think about if you're, you know, if you live 70,000 years ago, you don't have huge stores of food. You know, so if a volcano wipes out your food supply for the next two months, you're probably going to die. Um, now that won't happen. We have food stores, you know, we have all these, <laughs> we have all these preppers, you know, people are going to serve, some people are going to survive some of this stuff, right? Um, but 70,000 years ago, probably not. So, yeah, that's what it looked like in the evening. Remember the eruption started at 8.30 in the morning and it went into the evening and you can start to see that, you know, remember this is completely snow packed, right? And now all this ash is falling. The ash is hot, so it's melting the snow. So you're starting to get mud flows that are starting to roar down the mountain uh, during this time. And 
at sunset it really starts to sort of die off. The effect of the initial blast was pretty impressive. So that first blast that took two minutes to travel 18 miles. Remember this is a heavily forested area. These are 150 foot tall lodgepole pines that were snapped off at the base. And they've done engineering studies of these trees and it suggested that you know, the, the winds required to snap a tree at its base to this extent was probably 450, 500 miles an hour. And hot. Um, and you can see it stripped all, the, stripped all the smaller branches off. Really, really impressive. Um, this was a logging setup that I think was about 10 or 12 miles from St. Helens. You can see the damage. Um, it took skidders and loaders and blew them three, four hundred feet. These are not small pieces of equipment. So it takes, you've probably seen semi slip over on the interstate in 70 or 80 mile an hour winds. This thing just rolled. It rolled hundreds of yards in this kind of wind. Bent large pipes. Certainly, you can get a sense for how powerful that initial blast was. The weird thing was, so you had volcanic peak of St. Helens, and then this blast happened to the north. And there were places that were 10 or 12 miles from St. Helens. After that initial blast, they started flying around in helicopters looking for survivors. And they would see these little eruptions of ash tens of miles from St. Helens and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, until a little later, what they figured out was giant ice chunks had been carried out by some of the blast, covered in hot ash, flashed to steam, and then you get a little steam explosion way out on sort of the flat air, flatter areas away from the volcano. So this was one that didn't flash to steam, but it's just a chunk of ice that was buried beneath some of the ash. And you can see how thin the ash layer is above it. It's not very thick. But yet, if it was hot enough, it would flash and then create these little craters and they would steam away. But we, geologists are wondering, are there new vents popping up? What the, what's going on? It took a while to actually figure this out. They were really concerned that there was going to be sort of a line of eruptions that was going to continue on. But it just happened to be steam blasts from ice chunks. Okay, so this is kind of the aftermath. Okay, so you see the summit of St. Helens. It lost 1,500 feet or so of its upper part of the cone, left sort of an amphitheater-shaped crater. Over here, this is Spirit Lake. The landslide that slipped off of St. Helens to allow that blast to occur pretty much landed right in Spirit Lake. And the level of Spirit Lake went up 300 feet just from all the crap that landed in it. And right beneath this point right here, there was a lodge called Spirit Lake Lodge. Um, now it's under 300 feet of debris, but there was an old guy that had lived his whole life there. He was sort of the proprietor of this lodge. His name was Harry Truman, just like the president. And he was 91 years old, he refused to leave. He, you know, they said, you need to evacuate. He said, nope, stay in, mountain will never hurt me. And in fact, the Friday before, remember this eruption happened on Sunday. So the Friday before, a bunch of school kids in Portland raised enough money to send a helicopter in, fly him out. And what he did is he flew to the school, he talked to all the kids, told them, you know, I'm not gonna leave my home, the mountain will never hurt me, and he flew back. So Harry is under 300 feet of debris right there. Um, you can see that the blast went over the top of this mountain. That's a 5,000 foot mountain and the blast just hopped right over it, no problem. So it, you get a sense for the sort of devastation. It was complete. You know, geologists, biologists didn't expect to see anything living in here afterwards, but lo and behold, within a few weeks, there were elk moving across the plain, um, spiders, you'd see spiders all over the place, little plants would come back. Um, Ground squirrels somehow managed to get into the ground long enough for the heat to dissipate and then dug their way back out. So it didn't completely obliterate the life from the area. Life is pretty persistent. These critters have a way of, uh, have a way of surviving. Little closer view, you get a sense. This is probably 
five or six miles from the volcano. You see this little area right there where they're setting up. Um, the scale of things is really difficult to explain at a place where, you know, the volcano itself is so big. But it looks pretty much completely obliterated. But yet, a couple weeks later, signs of life coming back already. As I said, all that melted glacial ice and snow mixed with ash and sent some huge mud flows down the river. And you can sort of see like the bathtub ring up here shows you just how high the uh, mud flows actually were. And then there's a person right there for scale. So pretty impressive mud flows, made it all the way down to the Columbia River. So much material ended up in the Columbia that it shut down shipping for a while. And Columbia is pretty important shipping route trying to get uh, goods and services to uh, places like Portland. As I mentioned before, people died. Um, this particular guy, this is really interesting. So he had slipped around a roadblock, set up camp. He was photographing the volcano. He woke up early that Sunday morning. He was photographing St. Helens as the whole eruption took place. And apparently after a few seconds, he realized that it was not going to end well for him. And remember, this is the, the days of film. You know, you didn't have digital cameras back in 1980. So he had his film, and he, he knew he was going to die. So what he did is he took the film out of the camera, put it in his mouth, climbed in the trunk of his car, shut it, and baked to death. And he was discovered, you know, a few days later, and they found the film, and they actually developed it. And if you look at I think it's the... I gotta remember this. I think it's December 1981 edition of National Geographic. They actually developed this film and put it in the magazine. So you can, if you're into that morbid sort of stuff, you can kind of go check that out. But yeah, this guy knew he wasn't gonna make it. And... <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I thought he wanted to preserve it as best he could. Like, I, I'm sure you thought that that would provide him the most, you know, you, you, you when you know you're going to die, you're going for the glory. Either, you know, you know, if you think there's even a slight chance that you could survive, you're going to go to where you're going to be the most protected. And I guess he thought the trunk was. You can see the windows didn't survive the blast at all. And, yeah, he just baked in there. Um, a lot of, and you saw how gray it looks, right? Finding bodies in the stuff was impossible. And actually, most of the bodies that were found, and not everybody was found, they were found two to four weeks after the eruption, mostly by sense of smell. And you can see this guy right here. Um, yeah, he's actually, it, it's morbid, but yeah, he's bloating and giving off gases. And that's how they found the bodies, is by sense of smell. It's really, it's not a good way to go. You don't want to do this. So that was the May 18th eruption of Mount St. Helens. That's what you hear about, right? But St. Helens stayed active for the next six years. In fact, this was a week later. One week later, St. Helens had another eruption and sent a pyroclastic flow out of that amphitheater down onto the plain down below. And in fact, that guy, that grad student I told you about, he was in the airport and when he saw St. Helens erupt, he turned around and went right back and volunteered you know, to help find victims and stuff. And he was actually working down here Apparently, he had his back to this pyroclastic flow the whole time, didn't get the radio message to move, and the pyroclastic flow stopped a few hundred yards from where he was standing. So he almost bit it twice in one week. Um, one of the strangest guys I've ever met. He ended up being a good friend of mine, but the most socially maladjusted human being on the planet. He was just so inside his own head that he would be oblivious to stuff that was going on around him. Um, he ended up doing his um, PhD dissertation on the landslide that came off St. Helens. And it's really one of the finest pieces of geologic work that's probably ever been done. It's amazing. It's, it's one of the most well-referenced, well-cited works out there. Just truly great work, but he was a truly odd individual. Um, but I liked him. He was a good friend of mine. We were both students at the time. So that's what the inside of a pyroclastic flow looks like. You remember that previous photo looked like a big cloud coming down? That's what's inside that. So it's rolling rocks and debris that are like banging together, making all that ash, and then the heat from the ash carries it up and gives it that cloud shape. But a pyroclastic flow is an avalanche. It's an avalanche of 
fresh material coming out of a volcano. And this stuff was really hot, came to rest down on the plane. So if you get stuck in one of these pyroclastic flows, you're pretty much instantly dead. It's a combination of getting pulverized to death immediately, because these things are moving 100 miles an hour. You get hit by any of those rocks moving 100 miles an hour, it's going to kill you. And at the same time, it's 1,000 degrees centigrade. So you're going to get vaporized as well. It's a quick way to go. I don't know if it's painless, but the pain's not going to last for more than a millisecond or two. Not a good way to, to perish at all. So after that pyroclastic flow came down, they flew up into the crater at St. Helens and noticed this. And this is actually a lava flow, technically a lava dome, and you can see it right here. It's about 200 meters across, maybe 50 meters thick, of really thick, pasty lava. So it's called a dome because it has kind of this muffin dome shape. And so that sat in the crater for, so this was at the end of June. Um, it sat in the crater till July when another eruption happened and it blew it to bits. And then another dome came out and it sat in the crater until August and then another eruption blew it to bits. So you get these lava flows followed by explosions, and then there'd be a crater, and then lava would fill up the crater with a dome. And it was a pattern that repeated itself several times. So there's the crater, and then the crater would fill up with lava. And one day in October, the geologists were lucky enough to go in there when it was just squirting out new lava. So, so you can see lava, can see sort, lava of sort of coming in, coming here, in here, kind of right, in, right the in the middle, middle there. there. And when they flew when up they closer, flew up they could see this little patty of lava forming. So that is maybe 25 meters long and maybe five meters high. It's not much, actually not much bigger than this room. And then over the next day, it just grew and grew and grew. So by the next day, it's about 100 meters across and about 20 meters high. And a few hours later, it stopped erupting and it looked like this, kind of like a big muffin. So it ended up being two to 300 meters across, 50 meters thick. It's a pretty good size. Looked like a muffin, just sitting there. And then, for, so up until this point, there would be these domes that form, and then they'd get exploded, and then another dome would form, and then get exploded, another dome would form, and then it'd get exploded. This one in October that you see here of 1980, it didn't get exploded away. About a month later, another lava flow came out and piled right on top of it. There was a tiny little blast that opened up a little crescent-shaped break in the corner, you can see right here. And then lava started squirting out of that, and it made a dome here that sat on top of that older dome there. And this pattern repeated itself over the next five or six years. Every couple months, a new little patty of lava would come out and sort of plop itself down on top. And it grew and it grew and it grew into a really giant lava dome. They call it a composite lava dome because it's made up of lots of individual little eruptions. So you don't always see the red stuff like you do in Hawaii. It was pretty rare to actually see anything glowing at all. But every once in a while you'd see a crack where you could get an idea that, yeah, this stuff was really hot. So the stuff in Hawaii is erupted at about 1150 degrees C. This stuff was roughly 200 degrees cooler, 980. How close could you get to this? Um, you could stand on that. Wow. It'd be hot, but you could stand on it. You, couldn't, you wouldn't want to go right to where it's incandescent. You couldn't probably get within 10 feet of where it's incandescent because there's just so much heat coming off. But this gray stuff, yeah, you could stand on it. It would move. I mean, several feet below you, it's 1,000 degrees, okay, okay. you know? So, I don't know. I'd do it, but I don't think many other people would do it. I've actually done it. Not at that place, but one in Guatemala that I'll show you. Just to give you an idea of how slow this stuff is. So, this is dacite, which is a lot like andesite, which is far more viscous and sil silica-rich than basalt. Um, 
And you've seen Hawaii where it just sort of flows. You can actually watch it move. So this was on September 7th. So this is 9 7 1981. Okay, and I want you to pay attention. So this is the lava flow right up in here. And it's coming out and it's going to move downhill. And you see this sort of lighter colored little toe that's sticking out? So that's on September 7th of 1981. Here's the next photo that was taken. So this was four days later. There's that toe right there. So it moved from about here to there in about four days. So really slow movement, glacial. The scale is all messed up though. It's, this is actually much bigger than it looks. I don't know if you can see, but right there, all those, people. those are two people. And they are probably a quarter mile from that dome. So it doesn't look like much, but it is much. But at the end of the day, this stuff is not moving very fast at all. If you sat and looked at it, you would not see it moving. It would, you'd have to look at it for quite a while to notice any movement at all. This stuff is so viscous, it really has a hard time flowing across the Earth's surface. And then that's what it looked like when it was finished. And there were some crazy structures that formed. So a lot of times right at the end of one of these lava dome producing eruptions, it would make one of these sort of smooth creases up in top. And that was something I studied for my master's degree and PhD. So it's called a crease structure. They're kind of weird. You actually see these on lots of different compositions of lava flows. They're a fairly common lava flow feature. And my paper that I wrote on this actually gets cited all the time by people that do cryovolcanism. I talked about that weird sort of ice volcanoes that form on the outer satellites. They see this stuff out there all the time. So, you know, when I wrote this stuff back in the 90s, I would have never expected that, you know, somebody studying Europa would see something really similar. But they have, so kind of interesting where research goes sometimes. And that's what one of those things looks like up close. So every once in a while, the dome, and so here's the dome. This is in 1982. And you can see the dome starting to fill in the crater a little bit. Um, still looks pretty small, but that's probably five or six hundred feet high at that point in time. I don't know. Maps are having a mind of their own. So you get these steam blasts on occasion, and every once in a while they would melt snow that was in the crater. You can see there. And then it would produce a mud flow that would come out of the crater, feed into one of the river valleys, um, and then would move out towards the Columbia. And the sad thing is this particular one, this was in 1982, so roughly two years after the big eruption. So a lot of people lost their homes along the river valleys. And, you know, it's not, a, it's not an affluent part of Washington. You know, people are just sort of eking out in existence and volcano comes and wipes out your home and you don't have insurance. You still own the land. So what a lot of folks did is they ended up building houses pretty much over the top of their old houses that had been destroyed. So their house was destroyed, probably two or three, maybe five feet of mud piled up, and then that mud dried out, formed new soil, and then they just put their houses on top of it. But sadly, two years later, more mud flows go down and, and hit them again. So some people ended up losing two homes within the span of two years. That gives you a little better idea. So this particular mud flow, part of it flowed into Spirit Lake right there, and then part of it went down one of the river valleys off to the other side, just from a sort of a tiny little blast in the crater. So that's what the dome looked like when it was all said and done. So in 1986, it finally stopped erupting. And you can see it's a pretty good-sized mountain sitting within another mountain. So roughly 15 to 20 separate lava domes piled on top of one another to make this thing. Um, it was about 1,000 feet high when it was finally um, finished, and it was almost two miles wide at the base. So I mean, think about that. That's a, roughly a mile. <laughs> so these are big, big mountains. Pretty impressive. 
I was really lucky. I was a senior in college um, when I took this. I had just I had an internship there right as it sort of finished its eruption cycle. I got to be there during the lead up to the very last eruption. And it, that's what sort of hooked me on the whole field, and that's why I went to grad school to study volcanoes, is because I had a college internship playing around here. It's pretty awesome. So St. Helens sort of awakened a new kind of age in research, and people started looking at lava domes around the world. This is Santiaguito in Guatemala. So it erupted in 1902, one of the biggest eruptions of the last century, and it blew out the whole side of the volcano. But it left the peak. Unlike St. Helens, it left the peak. But it had sort of an amphitheater-like opening. And then it was quiet for 20 years. And then in 1922, it started forming a lava dome, and that lava dome's still active today. In fact, it's gonna be 100 years old here in a, about a year and a half. And it's been continually active the whole time. Lots of uh, lava flows coming off of it. Lots of pyroclastic flows have come off and killed people, unfortunately, in the area. But it's a really impressive lava dome that lasted a lot longer than St. Helens did. So St. Helens isn't unusual in the fact that it produces lava domes. Lava domes are a pretty common feature of a lot of these big, explosive, composite volcanoes. One of the most famous eruptions of the last century was Mount Pelee in Martinique. Um, I'm going to talk about this eruption in a few weeks, but basically 29,000 people died, only two survivors of this town. And you can see up here that right after the eruption happened, a lava dome with a huge spine formed up on top. So another one of these lava flow producing eruptions. This, this eruption was terrible. It's, uh, Nobody should have died. 29,000 people died because of politics, but we'll get into that later. It's one of the most interesting, terrible, horrible stories you'll ever hear between science and politics going bad. Um, so this is a lot, this was on the St. Helens Dome. This really doesn't have anything to do with geology, just kind of cool. Um, so I ended up working at St. Helens for a few years while I was a grad student. And one day we took a helicopter in and this plane had crashed. And I mean, it looks pretty bad, right? And you can actually see a human head right there. Okay. That guy's totally alive. It's my buddy. We just took pictures of each other in the wreckage. We actually found the two guys that flew this plane. They were perfectly fine. They were like 100 yards away, hunkered around a fumarole trying to stay warm. They had crashed it in the evening. They shouldn't have been in there. And I just thought this was a cool picture. The guy's really not dead. But yeah, you can survive a pretty mean plane crash. That's, that doesn't look good, does it? Okay, 